my class, for tonight's lecture, we are going to look at the socio-emotional, cognitive, and physical development in middle adults adulthood and we're going to look at Erickson and uh, his stages and how he defines the uh, crisis or task that we have to overcome of generativity versus stagnation. All right, so middle adulthood is one of the least studied periods of development, and uh, it was kind of, it's kind of considered the last unchildered territories in development. Our interest in middle adulthood began to rise with the rise of the baby boomer generation, and uh, really what it comes down to is that the baby boomers, it, it's, it's been the biggest population growth that uh, we've kind of had in modern times. So so before, uh, you know, the baby boomers and uh, that came out as a result of World War II there, in the late 40s, early 50s, and up until about the, the mid-60s, this would kind of be like all of our parents would uh, probably be in this baby boomer category there and uh, before this time we just we didn't see people living as long and uh, we just you know and those mortality rates and life expectancy rates were a lot lower but because of uh, you know research and technology we have been able to expand life expectancy and so in a way that's kind of uh, opened up this last part of our stages of development to where you know it used to be like once you hit about 30, 35, especially 40, you were considered to be like old. And then, you know, if you were lucky enough, you would live into your 60s, maybe your 70s. But now, you know, on average, men, um, well, I think uh, men live up into their 90s now. And, and women can live up to 100. I think the oldest woman who just recently died was something like 112 or 116. And, you know, wow, that that's just uh, really amazing when you think about it. About it. So, uh, so like I'm saying, so you know, so, so this whole last stage of our life used to be uh, lumped together in one big category, and you know, because of the baby boomers, we've been able to uh, kind of divide that out a little bit, and uh, you know, break it up into more stages, so that we've got that more holistic view of our development, because we know that development never stops until death, which will be the topic, or well, one of the topics of our next lecture when we talk about our last stage of development late adulthood and then a uh, death there <clears throat> all right just looking to see if there's anything else all right so when it comes to middle adulthood adulthood uh, we're probably familiar with things like midlife crises and we know that there are certain midlife events that happen for men and women uh, specifically things like menopause a decline in uh, physical activity um, some people have a decline in cognitive skills that actually is a myth not everybody gets dementia or Alzheimer just because they get older. Um, I do believe we had a crash course video where we talked about that. It was when he was talking about uh, fluid intelligence and crystalline intelligence there. So things like menopause would be universal kind of things that happen in middle adulthood. Um, men, for men, it's a de decline in uh, uh, testosterone and other hormone productions. And then we see uh, universal kind of lifetime events happen. And it's basically just like realizing or manifesting life goals that have to just do with family or work or whatever that individual deems important in his or her life. <clears throat> All right, so um, so with middle adulthood, we have this idea of cohorts. Let me go back here. <clears throat> and basically, when we're talking about cohorts, we have this idea of cohort effect, and it just relates to that... Uh, as we get older and go through life, we experience similar events, and uh, they're kind of generational things. So, like, everybody in a certain age group is going to be affected by these types of events. And uh, I guess just uh, off the top of our, I mean, you know, just right there, some of those uh, just midlife crises we go through, some of those just midlife events like menopause, Actuating our goals, you know, those are kind of things that, that will vary with cohorts, but it's also something that as cohorts you kind of experience at 
the same age time, not necessarily everybody's going through it at the same time. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and uh, so just like I was saying that, you know, we used to lo lump, you know, 40 to about the 60s all together. And with more research, with more people living longer for us to be able to, you know, to get that research and do more studies, we do know, you know, that there are major differences that it, and major um kind of a, I, I, I hate to use the word crises like Freud and Erickson use, I'd rather, I, I want to use pro, uh, plucking. There are major tasks and gifts that we have to learn, and you know, those do vary depending on our age, as we've already seen throughout class, and it's no different for once we get to be an adult there. And we know that things like our gender, our race, our socioeconomic status, those kind of things are going to up play as variables in our development in middle adulthood. <clears throat> And then we have these ideas of inter-individual variability, and that's just bas uh, basically those variables in life that account for those differences. And, you know, we, we kind of uh, create those variables as we go throughout our life and development, because everybody that we meet, all the experience that we have in life relate to how we're going to be at those different times in our life. So we have the inter-individual variability, and then we have the intra-individual variability. And basically what that is, is just that within ourselves as we grow and develop and we go through these different age groups, we're going to have some just an, uh, variability within ourselves and our own abilities there. So we could see something like maybe our our eyesight may start uh, getting a little bad and we have to get um bifocals, but then at the same time, we may still say, stay really sharp in other areas. So say something like uh, you, you play tennis and, you know, even though your eyesight is is uh, getting worse and you need to wear bifocals, at the same time, you know, you've been practicing tennis so much that you kind of sharpen those skills. And, you know, it's just one of those things, once again, that just depends on the individual there. All right, and so we know that as we go through middle adulthood, you know, we do have these physical changes we go through, and uh, one of the main problems with middle adulthood is uh, falling, especially once we start to get into our 60s. Falling is kind of a major uh, social, uh, societal, and kind of a healthcare. I don't want to say a uh, crisis, but uh, a, a serious issue that, uh, you know, that it needs to be considered in our society. And some of the ways that we can prevent so many fallings among these age group and among late, late uh, adulthood is just uh, diet and exercise. Um, falling is particularly more associated with women because as we get older, we know for a fact that our bone density changes and we're more prone to get osteoporosis and osteoporosis is just pretty much you know as you get older and just the effects of of your diet your health things like environmental toxins ter teratogens like we've talked about before when we were talking about pregnancy um, just those things, you know, they affect our bodies, and for some reason, as women, our bones just seem to deteriorate more, and so that's what osteoporosis is. It's when your bones start to deteriorate because you're not getting enough calcium, and uh, it's actually kind of cool. The first uh, big archaeological site I worked at many, many uh, decades ago was a 9,000-year-old uh, burial ground, and a lot of those and a lot of the individuals that were buried on that site, they did have signs of osteoporosis and other kind of like health-related malnutrition type diseases that you could see on a, a, some of their teeth. When you're actually able to uh, actually find a, a skull that has teeth in it, you can kind of uh, gently scrape the plaque off and then, you know, put it on a slide and look under the... Um, a microscope and be able to see what uh, you know kind of uh, different things going on what that person ate and uh, such things like 
that. So, uh, so it was really cool because you could see the osteoporosis in some of those bones, and it's like these little itty bitty holes that you get in there. And so, uh, so, so, uh, just to wrap that up. So, uh, you know, once again, it's very important to um, ensure that we are in good physical and mental health. I mean, that's a key part of our development and how we have those more healthy developments, and also how we kind of expand our stages of development. So we get those, you know, longer lifespans there. <clears throat> All right, and so when it comes to middle adulthood, I think this is probably when the effects of aging start to really hit us and even uh, our kind of... Um, a status in society kind of starts to change a little because I think it's, it's kind of apparent to others that we're getting up there in our year so you know people do kind of tend to change the way they respond or the way they market especially once again to women you know as as we start getting into this middle adulthood stage this is when we really start getting those anti-aging type products and you know hair coloring type products really thrown on us so when it comes to aging we have primary aging and secondary aging and uh, primary aging it's just that it's just those inevitable things that we can't change things like you know our hair getting gray things like you know getting wrinkles because of just you know us having long lifespans and being exposed to the sun and and things of that matter and then we also have secondary aging which is uh, just kind of age related type thing so things that could uh, relate to maybe disease or just uh, once again environmental um, st stimuli or stressors or just how you went about taking care of yourself during your life you know those are all things that kind of age you too so um, two of the most common things of course they say that age you smoking and drinking and so uh, those would be some secondary aging there and we already talked about uh, some of these uh, appearance changing so let's go down to body build and I've already kind of talked about that so we do know that you know as we get older um, our bone structures start to change we lose some of that bone density and so uh, we were more susceptible to osteoporosis especially those of us who are white women and uh, interestingly Asian women seem to be more at risk for osteoporosis too but we don't see that among african-american or hispanic women and then just uh, based on my work in archaeology we do know uh, we do see osteoporosis among native american groups there too and i uh, you know just just a little side thing here but once again we see how you know native americans are totally at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to society to where you know our statistics and data on things that go on with that group are very very limited you know which is why i'm really glad glad that i got to do the work that i did there in my younger years of working with different native american tribes and then uh, along with changing bone density we also have uh, uh, we also see our metabolisms changing as we start to get to middle adulthood and so uh, especially for women but but I'd say men too were at more risk of kind of uh, heart related diseases things with blood pressure things like diabetes things like clogged arteries and uh, a lot of that comes from you know our metabolism slow down and we tend to just kind of gain weight when we get to this stage but it's kind of interesting though so we tend to gain weight from like 40 to 60 but then uh, kind of once we hit probably about 70 to 80 it kind of seems like we have a tendency to kind of start losing weight then so uh, just kind of interesting thing there and then, of course, when it comes to mobility and strength, we do tend to, you know, start having these kind of muscular skeletal problems. So, you know, we tend to have more aches and pains in our joints and in our muscles. And, and you know, because of that, we just kind of naturally kind of slow down where, you know, we can't, we're not as strong or, or as mobile as we used to be. But uh, once again, you know, exercise and, and keeping ourselves 
active and mobile are kind of ways that we can combat that. So, you know, you are capable of doing the same things at 60, 70 that you were at age 20. It's just at 60, 70, it's going to take you a little bit longer to accomplish those tasks. I can use farming as a good example. My neighbor is in her 70s, She's got a big goat farm, horses, so a lot more to do than I do than I have to do on my little farm. And that woman still gets out every day, takes care of her animals, does everything she has to do. And I really don't know if you guys know what's involved with a farm, but uh, especially when you have horses, you know, before you can ever learn to ride a horse, you have to learn how to take care of it. And that comes from cleaning the stalls. If you want to ride horses, you got to clean, you got to scoop the poop first. And, uh, you know, it's not, it, it's not like it's, it's totally difficult stuff to do, but it is physical stuff that you have to do. And so, you know, a lot of old farmers who have been doing this stuff their whole life, they're still able to get out in their 60s, 80s, and, and their 90s and still do their farm work. But like I said, it just probably takes them longer than it did when they were younger. And they really don't have a problem with that if you talk to them because, you know, now that they're older and they don't have to worry about jobs and stuff like that, they kind of appreciate being able to just kind of uh, relax with their farms a little more there. So uh, just to note that, you know, even though we do get a little more feeble as we age, it doesn't mean that, you know, we just give up and go laid out in the woods and die, right? You know, it all depends on that individual variability. And like I said, the more active and mobile we keep ourselves in life, you know, the more we keep our, we prevent ourselves from having, you know, more problems than we should as we get age. And really just mobility is the key to that. Keep our bodies healthy and strong. All right, and then of course we start seeing a uh, decline in our sensory systems and our vital organs there. So uh, mostly vision, that's the most common uh, problem or common thing we start to see decline in midlife. And it's usually a uh, near vision, which is why people need uh, bifocals or, or just reading uh, glasses. It's because they, they can't, they start to not be able to see up close. And uh, studies have shown that because of the rise of just kind of technology and from us just, you know, always having a computer screen in front of us, always having a cell phone in front of us and looking at teeny tiny uh, text like I messed up and put on this uh, slide right here, that that is also having effect on our near vision or a... Uh, uh, what is it, uh, presbyopic vision there too. So uh, just some interesting things to think about and some of those reasons why they suggest that, uh, you know, we balance out our time on our electronic devices with, uh, you know, kind of the real world there because uh, it can kind of create adverse health effects on us. And then another common vision problem we see is glaucoma. And uh, this is probably something we're used to seeing in old people. And you know glaucoma in uh, older animals and in older adults by uh, they get like these little kind of like clouds that build up on their eyes is uh, what you're seeing with glaucoma. And then um, another one of our main senses that seem to go is hearing. And so a lot of people will have to get hearing aid. It was kind of funny before my dad died and he had to get a hearing aid. The doctor told him uh, that now that he has his hearing aid, he'd be able to uh, hear women and small children very well. And my dad looked at him and said, I've got a wife, five daughters, and grandkids. I don't want to hear them. So he'd never wear his hearing aids. Or he'd pretend he didn't wear his hearing aids and he couldn't hear what anybody said. So kind of funny there, but that, that's kind of how my dad was. So, all right, and then, uh, like I said, once we start getting older, you know, we have to really... Um, and think about how our stress, or stress, excuse me, well, yeah, stress too. We have to think about how stress, diet, and, elf, and exercise plays a role on our bodies. And so uh, we th see things like cardiovascular systems, kind of uh, our cardiovascular health tends to decline. We get more of that plaque build up in our arteries. And so it causes things like hypertension or, or strokes or even heart attack. And, and men, 
are kind of at a slightly higher risk than that. A good way, though, to um, uh, prevent any kind of uh, cardiovascular kind of health-related problems, especially things like stroke, uh, strokes and tension, they recommend that you uh, take one aspirin every day. Day, but that's not something they recommend until you start getting into, you know, about your 40s and 50s there. And then, of course, we have to look at things like uh, respiratory systems. We do see a lot of people end up having some kind of lung type problems as they get older. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to say that that's something that is very veritable. I mean, we see a lot of respiratory problems in older people who've spent a lot of their lives working in factories. Mesothelioma is a, a main problem. And so we see that people worked in factories. We see that in a lot of older adults now because asbestos used to be like the number one building materials. And, you know, we now know that that causes mesothelioma. And pretty much, you know, asbestos is like little tiny shards of glass and kind of like this polyester stuffing stuff that you use mainly as insulation, right? And so, uh, as you're working with that and, uh, and and just stuff like that, you know, those little shards of glass, they kind of, they get into, they, they just, you know, they get all over your skin, they get in your nose, they get in your mouth, and so they eventually get into your lungs. And then you also see a lot of people who uh, work in coal mining seem to have a lot of respiratory problems there, too. So, um... I'm sure if we were to do a study and compare people who lived in uh, cities versus people who lived in rural areas, I would think that there would probably be more respiratory problems in those city areas because there's more just environmental toxins with, you know, more people, more traffic more factories, but then that's going to be the uh, kind of variable there with the rural uh, living is what is going on in those environments. I mean, rural areas is where you find, you know, tend to see people in a poorer house because those areas tend to be the ones that, that uh, you know, have these environmental justice issues going on. You know, it's in the poor areas is where they're going to put the stuff like the coal mines or the uh, nuclear power dumps. And, and, you know, that's affecting people's health there, too. So, you know, once again, we got to uh, keep a holistic perspective and uh, take into account all the factors that play an effect on our uh, development and just, uh, you know, overall what it means to be human in general. And then lastly, we do see uh, uh, declines in urinary systems. So, you know, with age, our bladder becomes a little more elasticity. And so uh, we tend to yeah, get bladder-related problems. For men, uh, prostates and prostate cancer is a main concern. And then just uh, things like liver damage, kidney failure. Those are things we have to worry about more in a uh, uh, middle adulthood and later adulthood. And like you said, it just comes down to, you know, a lot of just how one takes care of him and herself throughout life. So, all right. So, lastly, we see changes in our reproductive and sexual uh, functioning. So, we know, uh, just to break this down real quickly, menopause is a major life transition for women in life. And uh, it's a major life transition because uh, it's kind of when we stop bearing children. And uh, that puts a lot of women in kind of a, a, just that alone sets up a midlife crisis because society is set up to where we don't really value older women. You know, our society is all about young and beautiful and, and so, you know, women get to the point of menopause and they feel like they're not a productive member of society anymore. You know, they can't have children, so they have nothing to give back to society. And so that causes a lot of depression once women meet menopause. And, and we do see uh, a depression related to a lot of uh, postmenopausal women and, you know, just menopause in general there. And so uh, basically what we see is that uh, as we age, or just uh, both men and women, hormone production seems to decline. And, you know, <clears throat> 
when it comes to that, I mean, you know, there are things that women can do to uh, help keep themselves sexually healthy and active. I mean, that's a big part of menopause, too. You know, not only do women just feel like they can't build children anymore, but now they just can't engage in those sexual activities like they used to when they were younger. And so it's kind of a freedom, you know, taking away a freedom thing. However, though, because of things like hormone replacement therapy and because of different types types of uh, drug therapy and things like uh, lubrication and, and just, you know, once again, proper diet and exercise, women are able to uh, overcome these midlife crisis issues there. And then, of course, we see the same, uh, well, not the same thing, men don't go through menopause, but we see reproductive and sexual functionings declining in men, too. And it's because, you know, men's testosterone levels start to change as they get older, too. So we see problems like erectile dysfunction coming up, and, and we know that uh, there are many uh, prescription drugs out there to help deal with E. D. And then uh, men also have testosterone replacement therapy, which is just hormone replacement therapy to help with that. And then, of course, for men to, you know, diet and exercise plays a role in, uh, in the decline of their hormones. And so, uh, because of this decline in hormones, we do see that there is a decline in sexual activity in midlife. And uh, we see, uh, we want to say that, you know, intercourse becomes less common, but the longer people are together, we do, you know, they create bonds and we see more affection, more caressing uh, being expressed than those actual sexual engagements. Engagement, but once again, I think that that's kind of an individual thing, and, and it just kind of depends on the person. And uh, really, when it comes to this idea that as you get older, your sexual activity declines, I think it's one of those myths of older adulthood because uh, there's still plenty of people who who engage in uh, many activities. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, as we start to get older, it's kind of not as easy to shake off health problems. So we see that, you know, we get more susceptible to kind of acute illnesses, things like colds, things like the flu, pneumonia. And then we see those things like chronic illnesses and diseases, heart disease, arthritis. <clears throat> And then we see for about 16% to a percent of people in their 50s and 30% in their 60s have some kind of mental or physical impairment that limit their activities. It's very interesting. And uh, so we note that, but then we go and we look at uh, kind of self-surveys, and uh, we see that the majority of people in middle age, they define themselves as being in very good or excellent health. And uh, it's, it's um, a lesser percentage than uh, people in younger adulthoods and uh, we also see that when people have lower socioeconomic status they t tend to have a lower health too and so we see that uh, we also you know genes play a role and uh, things in our development during middle adulthood so once again we see things like cancer heart disease you know those leading causes of death in middle adulthood you know these are when we have to start being very wary of these types of d diseases and uh, a lot of these things do have a genetic component so if you know that your family has a history of heart disease history of cancer you should be a little more aware of taking care of yourself um, um, obesity, diabetes, cancer, heart attacks run in my family on both sides of my family and uh, I struggled with weight throughout my whole life and I got to the point there in my 20s where I was pretty much told you know lose weight now and keep it off I, I was on the risk of getting diabetes and uh, uh, having very high cholesterol and uh, so so you know it, it, it is really important to maintain a healthy diet and healthy exercise the way that uh, I figured out simple way to get my cholesterol down was uh, eating greens just mustard greens collard greens turnip greens those are that was a, a great way to uh, you know if you start getting high cholesterol give yourself a, a you know add greens to every dinner that you eat and uh, it's really really good healthy benefits for you 
uh, for you there. And a good thing about us being in the South is that uh, Southerners know how to make their grains, right? So, all right. And just like I said, you know, our behaviors affect our health when we're uh, in middle adulthood. And things like sleep especially affect our health. And, um, and you know, uh, sleep, is, uh, sleep is important. This is kind of where things like, you know, our hormones and neurotransmitters get to recharge. So things like, uh, you know, cortisone levels can go down. Dopamine levels can go up. Melatonin levels go up. Serotonin go up, you know, when we have good sleeping habits. And so, you know, good sleep is just a part of that kind of good diet, good, health, uh, good exercise. Take care of yourself. And then, of course, we can't, cl uh, we can't can't rule out the effects of the environment on our health too and uh, so you know that just all relates back to uh, diet and exercise all right then and of course stress is a factor that uh, pretty much at any stage of our life we have to deal with and we have to find those kind of healthy ways to deal with stress because stre stress does have very adverse effects upon our health <coughs> Excuse me. And basically, how we handle uh, stress. A stress comes down to how we perceive stress and just how we go about allowing that stress to dictate our life. And, uh, you know, when we allow stress to persist in our life and, and to kind of get the better of us, you know, it does make us more susceptible to getting kind of illnesses and diseases. <clears throat> And uh, when we're uh, under a lot of stress, we see that allostolic load, and that's just, you know, the wear and tear that stress causes on our body. And then, of course, stress can affect our personality types. And so, you know, main personality types are type A and type B. B. And uh, those type A personalities are the more kind of outgrowing and energetic ones. So, you know, stress t seems to be uh, influenced type A in personalities the most because uh, we're pretty impatient. We want everything right now. When we don't get it right now, it does tend to stress us out a little bit more. Where type Bs are a little bit more laid back and so they're not, more su they're not as susceptible to stress there. And then, of course, it all comes down to uh, that mind-body connection, you know, how we think, how we believe that all affects, you know, our physical body. And so, you know, the power of positive thought, the more positively we think, the more positive uh, kind of influence and effects that, have, that has on us in our life. And then, you know, we can say the same for negative thoughts and feelings there. All right, and so when it comes to cognitive development, we do have, you know, the typical myths, like I've already said, is that as we get older, you know, our brains tend to deteriorate. So things like intelligence decreases, and we already have that those ideas on fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence. <clears throat> and so, uh, what we have seen in the past is that intelligence seems to decline as people grow older. But, you know, it just, uh, once again, it's it just depends on individuals and then individual cohorts, too. I mean, um, in the past, it was kind of uh, frowned upon in society that older people cannot get educated. It was, you know, that thing, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. But that's something that has changed in about the last two decades. And we see, you know, people at any step in adulthood, that is, at any stage of adult development, coming back to school, and we do say, see more middle age and older adults coming back to get an education, and that's kind of a way to kind of deal with those midlife crises, especially for women, once again, because, uh, you know, now that we've hit menopause, our children are all out of the house, you know, women start tend to be able to turn around then and start focusing on self. And so a lot of women, you know, they, they neglected their educations to take care of their family. And so now that they don't have to do that anymore, they turn towards uh, focusing on themselves. And uh, I think that's a great thing. I think that anybody can always uh, work to educate themselves. You know, education is the key. And 
then we have to look at, you know, once again, in, in individual differences there and just uh, environmental differences there that would affect somebody's intelligence. I mean, um, you know, d we don't know what causes Alzheimer's or dementia, and uh, we can't really stop it. We can't slow those processes down. But, you know, once again, just exercising your brain, keeping your brain strong is a great way to, you know, help not get those diseases later in life. And, uh, you know, that's why uh, a lot of people, they do things like a word puzzles, crossword puzzles. I mean, you know, brain strength training exercises are a way to help keep your, uh, keep your senses sharp about you as you get older. And then, of course, we uh, have these ideas of crystallized and fluid intelligence that we already kind of talked about w in our um, crash course video a few a, f a, a few weeks ago. And so we see that uh, as we get older, we have that decline in one of our types of intelligence. But just once again, like I said, it just goes down to individuals and just uh, how we go about taking care of ourselves. All right, and so uh, as we get older, there is the idea that with age comes experience and wisdom. And once again, we have to remember that this is an individual thing, too. You know, some people, as they get older, you know, they're going to continue educating themselves and they are going to gain that wisdom and gain more expertise on something. And then, you know, just creativity. And creativity is just not about, like, the arts and literature type creativity. Creativity is a key part of our critical skills because we, it, it you know, as human beings, problem solving is the main thing that we do. That's really how we learn, grow, that how, that's how we have evolved. That's the reason that we have, you know, modern society that we have today. It's because of our ability to solve problems and we always call that uh, critical skills, but there's a lot of creativity involved in that because you have to think it first. Nothing exists in this world without going through that mental plane first. We have to think it before we can manifest it in this world. And that's where the creativity part comes of problem solving. So as we get older, you know, uh, once again, those of us that continue to work on these things in our life in those healthy ways, we can, you know, improve our expertise and our creativity. And then uh, some things that we have to remember with creativity is, uh, once again, just because we get a little older and we can't do things as quickly as we used to in the past, we do tend to see that uh, creativity starts to peak in about their 40s and kind of declines after that but what we are actually seeing is that uh the quantity is what declines it's not the quality so here's a good one so uh, a good example is that in your 20s you go out and you're able to uh you know say you work in construction like my husband does building houses and so when you're in your 20s you you build those houses lickety split you know you like little monkeys climbing up and getting on the roofs and stuff and and you know it's usually the men who have done it for 40 50 years who are in their 40s 50s 60s there's the guys that stay on the ground and they do kind of the the, the more simple tasks not less important tasks of course but simpler things like cutting the wood you know because they're just not as mobile to get up on the roofs anymore and so we see that you know they can't work as quickly but yet they still produce well quality work and so, you know, once again, it just comes down to how well we take care of ourselves in life, how well we respond to stress, and just really just uh, how well we work on ourselves and our own development throughout life. As human beings, we are all individual, and our development is no different. No matter what age span we are at, there are going to be some people who are, you know, less developed and some people that are more developed. And that's really why I like uh, plucking stages of development the most because I think he accounts for that variability. You know, you can be 40 years old, but you're still kind of stuck in an adolescent mentality. And the good thing about that, though, is that, you know, you, you can go back and work on that. You know, it never stops. You can always go back and work to get yourself to, you know, the 
place you want to be and being the person what you want to be being that fully functioning individual like Carl Rogers talks about there all right, so when it comes to our developmental tasks, our timelines and processes in midlife, we know that those tasks are going to change. Um, when we're younger, of course, we set up goals and expectations for ourselves, and uh, those start to come together in middle adulthood. Sometimes those goals we set for ourselves don't turn out exactly how the, we thought that they would in life, and uh, but that's not really a bad thing because sometimes, you know, life opens up in other ways that you didn't know was possible and so uh, we start to uh, in middle adulthood we get to focus more on our security needs like we saw Maslow talked about in his hierarchy and so we're more focused on those security needs which makes us be able to focus more on those kind of love self-esteem needs and then kind of those self actualizing needs too and so when we're younger, we're kind of more fuck, uh, more focused on the future and thinking about, oh, you know, what comes next, what comes next. But once we get to middle adulthood, it's kind of the time when we start to slow down and we can kind of be more mindful of the present there. And then, of course, you know, we see these changing relationships in our life. And uh, that just all relates back to the idea of midlife crises because, you know, midlife crises and these kind of uh, physical, socio-emotional, and cognitive things that are going on in our bodies, we get to the point in life, you know, at, at midlife to where we may not feel like we're actually giving back to society anymore. And so this is where we get Erickson's uh, stage of middle adulthood and those tasks of uh, generativity versus stagnation all right so uh, generativity basically it's just that you know that desire that need to contribute to family community and society and so uh, we want to do that and, and so in middle adulthood we're focused on doing that by kind of preparing the next generation and so you know we want to um, you know in middle adulthood we want to make sure we have that creativity and that expertise to be able to guide along the next generation and those you know healthy positive and productive ways and uh, so we have to find ways that we can do that when we get to this stage of life and if we can't do that then we see the opposite side of the spectrum we we uh, see that stagnation and that's just when a lot of and that's just when uh, people in middle adulthood where they're only focused on themselves and so uh, a lot of times this comes out in those midlife crises <laughs> sorry guys my my new puppy is barking at my older dog, Matty. Stop. And so uh, we see these in those midlife crises there of, you know, someone he's been so obsessed with his career and so focused on that that maybe he doesn't have time to focus on his family and his personal intimate relationships. And so, you know, finally after 20 years, his wife has just had enough. And so he ends up getting getting uh, a divorce. And then, you know, all that hard work that he put into his life, it just, you know, to, it then ends up not meaning nothing. Meaning nothing and so then you see that you see a kind of a decline there and uh, you know in those stages of development those socio-emotional physical and cognitive development and you know people can kind of get to feel just a little worthless and just kind of wither away and so because of that we do see um, suicide rates if we were to compare our groups I'd say um, men in midlife from 40s to 60s they are the ones to uh, more likely to commit suicide <clears throat> All right, and so Erickson feels that we struggle with this at this stage of our life is because this is when we are at a point in life to where, you know, we are able to contribute the most to others. So we have those resources. So feasibly, we have the experience. We have the wisdom. We have things like money to be able to help others. Of course, that's not all of us, but thank goodness there are some people who have accumulated enough wealth in their life that they and, and they're generous enough to give back to their community and you know Bill Gates is a great uh, example of that him and his wife Melinda I mean they they do a lot of um, uh, good humanitarian things around the world there <clears throat> And 
And then last but not least there, we see that when it comes to this idea of generativity, that when you have that healthy development and you're actually, you know, working with that at in your uh, mid-adulthood, you see that uh, people who have greater generativity, they're more satisfied and just a uh, overall happier in their life in general and uh, we see to see that more in middle adults than we do with younger adults and I think it just goes back to because you know once again when we're younger we're we're kind of more focused in that you know kind of goal oriented working towards our futures and so uh, in a way we don't kind of get those moments to relax as much as we should but that's where mindfulness comes into play because you know we always can take that time in our lives no matter what stages of development we are at and take that time to be mindful and, and reflect and reflect on where we've been where we're at and where we would like to go in our life Alright, so once we get to midlife, we see more developmental timetables, and it's basically, it's just, you know, we're not seeing those 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 just clear-cut kind of developmental things happening like we have looked at throughout the, you know, the development of humans throughout this or, or you know in a lifetime throughout this class so you know when we know when we're babies those timelines of you know when you walk when you say your first words um you know those reflexes when those things develop you know when you know look at piaget and when we develop those types of motor and uh cognitive type skills like those are all developmental milestones that we reach things like puberty would be another one one too. But once we get to middle adulthood, you know, other than that decrease in our hormones and, and sexual activity, which I don't think is really a defining moment of middle adulthood, but, uh, you know, there's not really anything that, that uh, you know, there's no really milestones that we need to accomplish there. And so, really, what, and, and, and uh, you know, once again, if we look at it from the generativity side, we've accomplished our goals in life, and so, you know, we don't have to worry about focusing on, you know, getting an education, getting a house. And so, uh, what that does is just, uh, you know, it creates this shift in our perception of time, and, uh, you know, once again, it all comes back to uh, just individuals and how they have lived their life to where we can, uh, you know, actually set up of if somebody is where they want to be in their life. And, you know, mostly by the time we get to middle adulthood, about, my, about our 40s, we kind of do start kind of figuring it out a little bit more. But, uh, like I said, that never stops. I have a friend who is uh, in her 80s and just the other day she was saying how she's 82 and life is still constantly throwing her lessons and and I was like you know very very uh, good point there no matter how old we get we never stop learning and growing and we shouldn't think that we ever do that you know life really is a beautiful thing that we can always you know experience something new and that uh, helps us towards those paths of fully functioning and self actualization there all right and uh, so basically when once we get to midlife you know this is the time when we have set up our careers and so we see that uh, you know the meaning of work take or, or just work takes on a different context and so we have these ideas we have the uh, oops sorry guys give me just a second here the social uh, social <laughs> Social contact. Oh, I don't know how to. So our meaning of work change. Oh, give me just a minute, guys. Goodness, this is like the end too. <laughs> and, ah, aha! There we go. I just do that. Aha. So we see that the meaning of work has changed, and that's because, you know, once again, we've set up our careers, we're, we're kind of established in the career we're going to have for the rest of my life. So we see the context uh, changing there. So we have um, a social contact, we have these personal needs, financial needs, and then, of course, generativity. And so uh, when we think about work at this time in our life, these are the different contexts that we're thinking about. And so if we were to ask somebody what do you think as far as these four uh, contexts, uh, contexts go 
which one of these would be the most important and in, in middle life so uh, kind of think about you know project yourself into the future and think about you know what you think is going to be important in your midlife and just uh, one or two sentence tell me what you think that is and then uh, submit that to the Dropbox I have set up on canvas that is actually linked in the other PowerPoint on uh, Maslow and Rogers and uh, that ends this lecture guys as always if you need anything just a phone call email or online office visit away thanks for everything that you do and continue striving for excellence until next time guys thanks